You kids today with your web flicks and your quibbies have it pretty good. Any anime you could hope to watch is just there on the internet, waiting for you to binge it at your leisure on whatever device you happen to have handy. Back in my day, outside of pricey home video releases, the only way to watch anime legally was on television, like the big fat old ones, and our viewing options were thus limited to the few anime the available networks chose to run at the precise times they chose to run them. In the late 90s and early aughts, the one-time slot almost universally dedicated to this purpose was Saturday mornings between 8 a.m. and noon. And to any weeb who grew up on Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Dragon Ball, or Sailor Moon, those mornings were sacred communion. Now, this may strike you as a demonstrably less convenient, and if you know anything about analog broadcast tech, worse looking way of watching anime than any of our present options, but what you don't realize is that I have very fond memories of Saturday morning anime blocks, and therefore, they were objectively good. Okay, that's definitely not true, but there was something relaxing about getting to watch a variety of shows, not just one monotonous marathon, without having to think about what you wanted to see next. At most, you'd have to flip between two or three different blocks to avoid the lamest shows in each one. But today, at the suggestion of JoshmanVGH on Twitter, I'll be constructing a hypothetical four-hour block of roughly tween-appropriate anime so good that you won't even think about touching that dial. At least, not if you share my specific tastes. If this programming schedule doesn't quite do it for you, I'd love to hear what your personally perfect Saturday morning anime lineup would look like in the comments down below. Now, to catch the attention of the earliest risers and keep them from changing the channel, we need to start our Saturday morning strong with a fun, well-made anime that's as close to universally appealing as we can get. But the trick is, we don't want to burn the kids who are sleeping in after staying up late doing homework, or more likely traumatizing themselves with our equally hypothetical Friday night anime block. So our 8 a.m. show needs to be something that you wouldn't want to turn off, something you can easily get invested in, but it can't be the kind of thing that leaves you lost if you miss an episode or two. I think the Pokemon Sun and Moon anime fits this bill quite nicely, for reasons outlined in a video that you can no longer watch due to the Pokemon Company's extremely strict YouTube copyright enforcement. For similar reasons, I'm going to avoid showing too much of the show here, but you really only need to watch an episode or two of Sun and Moon on Netflix to see what it has to offer. That being a laid-back, slice-of-life approach to the Pokemon formula, with an emphasis on character and creature-driven comedy and fluid, funny animation over the more stiff and serious battling and boilerplate adventure stories that define the rest of the series. Not that there's anything wrong with that kind of storytelling. No, of course not. I love the old Pokemon anime as much as the next millennial, if not more so. It's just that Sun and Moon is one of those rare shows where you can really jump into just about any episode with zero context and have a good time with it. Heck, you can even drop into the middle of an episode and enjoy yourself watching all the adorable background Pokemon gags. There'd be no pressure to wake up for Sun and Moon, but it would be a very nice treat for those who can manage it. As we roll into 8.30 and more kids start dragging themselves out of bed, that becomes less of a priority, but as a courtesy to the stragglers who perhaps capped off their late night anime sesh with an hour or two of Game Boy under the covers, not that I'd know anything about that, I'm gonna keep the next show on the light and accessible side of things as well. Metabots is one of the more forgotten byproducts of the wave of Pokemania that swept the anime industry at the turn of the century, but it's also, for my money anyway, one of the absolute best. Its high concept is neat and easy to grasp. Rather than battling with collectible monsters, kids in this show build their own custom companion robots, piloted by special AI cores called Metals. Our hero, Iki, is a less fortunate kid who couldn't afford a Metabot of his own until one lucky day he stumbled upon a discarded metal in the river. When he plugs that metal into a cheapo frame given to him by a kindly, if vaguely pathetic, convenience store clerk, he discovers that it has a mind of its own and a serious attitude problem. But then, so does Iki, and while they butt heads a lot, he and his sassy new partner Metabee end up becoming fast friends. Together, they fight to earn new meta parts by wagering for them in row battles. Those wagers are overseen by a mysterious eldritch being known only as Mr. Referee, who is everywhere at all times, always ready to make a row battle official. And he's far from the only weirdo in this world. The streets are stalked by a gang of gimp-suited goons known as the Rubber Robos, who try really hard to be evil, but 
aren't very good at it and don't really seem to know what that means, so most of their schemes just end up being surreal pranks. Like, say, giving all the houses in the city goofy-looking makeovers to turn it into a theme park. An evil theme park. Metabots offers a thoroughly tongue-in-cheek take on the whole Poca-Clone premise, and that strong sense of humor really helped to set it apart from its contemporaries back in the day, but its real standout feature is its animation. The show's credit list is a veritable who's who of future anime industry legends. I'm talking Kenji Kamiyama, Mamoru Kanbei, Masahiro Ando, Masaki Tachibana, Shunsuke Tada, and the man himself, Hiroyuki Imaishi, just to name some of them, all working together on the same show under the direction of Darker Than Black creator Tensai Okamura. As you'd expect from that pedigree, Metabots is an absolutely wild ride, with expressive, creative, endlessly fun fights, and hilarious visual gags packed into every last episode. It really feels like the kind of thing Gynax might have cooked up in their prime, if they made weekly kid shows based on toys, that is, and that's a big part of why I picked it for this lineup. Metabots is a ton of fun just to look at, and it makes for a stellar early introduction to the world of Sakuga. On that note, I've chosen another show with stunning animation and a bit more plot for our 9am slot, Cardcaptor Sakura, which follows Sakura, a card captor, as she captures cards. More specifically, after finding an old book of spells in her archaeologist dad's library and releasing the magical entities trapped within by accidentally casting one of them, ten-year-old Sakura Kinamoto is tasked by Kerberos, the Book of Clouds' lazy if adorable guardian, with finding the scattered cloud cards and returning them to the tome. This was one of my absolute favorite things to watch on Saturday mornings back in the day. Coming off the stiff, limited animation of OG Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z, the cinematic, Sakuga-laden presentation Madhouse gave this series was mind-blowing to a young Jeff. And a lot of its episodes still impress me as an anime-literate adult. To be clear, though, we would not be broadcasting the butchered 90s card captors dub that I grew up on, as it undermined the series' story and undersold a lot of its unique humor and charm in a misguided attempt to pander to young boys. Also, as was the fashion for Magical Girl dubs at the time, it completely erased multiple gay relationships so as not to offend the delicate sensibilities of American bigots. That OP still slaps, though. In its original incarnation, at least, Cardcaptor Sakura is one of the most compelling, fleshed-out kid shows I've ever watched. Its characters feel surprisingly grounded and real, with complex inner worlds, and despite being rendered in a simplified, watercolor style, the world around them is made to feel tangible, with solid storyboarding and a lot of excellent effects animation. That grounded approach carries over to how the series treats its magic, not as a delivery system for cute costumes and convenient superpowers, but rather as an ancient, inscrutable force that can be dangerous in the wrong hands, or if left to its own devices. While Sakura does don the trappings of a typical magical girl with the help of her very rich best friend, her costumes are explicitly just fashion choices. She can just as well do magic in her PJs. Those tropey elements are almost incidental to the immersive tale of contemporary fantasy the series wants to tell. For me, at least, this fantasy-first approach makes it easy to get swept up in Cardcaptor Sakura's atmosphere and world. It's an enchanting, utterly spellbinding show. The perfect thing to suck our young viewers in and prime them for the more story-driven anime that will follow it. As we come up on 9.30, though, those kids have been staring at the screen for a solid hour and a half, so it's about time we drop some obligatory edutainment to reassure any concerned parents in the vicinity that they're not completely wasting their mornings. And I can think of no better anime to fill that role than Dr. Stone. Dr. Stone, if you're somehow not familiar already, follows teenage science prodigy Senku and his beefy himbo bestie Taiju as they use science to rebuild civilization 3,700 years after a mysterious light turned every person on Earth into a living statue. That's easier said than done, though, as they're opposed by a faction of primitivists who'd prefer to revive only the young and live in harmony with nature for the rest of their days, and that faction's leader, Tsukasa, can crush rocks and beat up lions with his bare hands. So, you know, Senku's gonna have to do some real science in if he wants to win this war. 
As I said in my video about Dr. Stone and all the things that make it great, the series has a knack for getting interesting scientific factoids to stick in your mind by integrating them into that grander plot of survival and ideological conflict in a post-human Stone Age world. But Dr. Stone does far more than just help kids remember trivia. It also works to instill a genuine appreciation for the scientific method and the long hours of study and experimentation it takes to discover and invent great things. Things. Without glossing over those tedious aspects of the job, Dr. Stone still manages to make being a scientist feel like the coolest thing ever, highlighting how, on Earth's default settings, scientific knowledge is tantamount to a superpower. There are a few shows I can think of better positioned to inspire young viewers to do great things, but more importantly, at least by the standards of our hypothetical target audience who definitely doesn't want to be taught things, Dr. Stone is just a ton of fun to watch. It features strong humor, compelling dramatic moments, likable characters, and a brilliant high concept that excites the imagination. It's the kind of show that I would have absolutely adored as a kid and then looked back at years later and been like, oh, that explains the cave girl thing. Yeah, my biggest concern with this pick was that Boichi's character designs might be a little too horny to fly in one of these blocks, but then I weighed that against the fountains of blood in cells at work and considered some of the shit Yu-Gi-Oh! and Digimon got away with back in the day. Please crush me. And I think we can take our chances with the imaginary censors on this one. Now that we're at the halfway point of this block and our educational obligations are taken care of, I think it's about time for a thematically appropriate commercial break. This video is brought to you by Wondershare and their affordable, easy to use video editing software, Filmora 9. Over the years, a lot of you have told me you'd like to make videos of your own, but don't know where to start. Well, I'm a firm believer that the best way to learn is to do, and Filmora 9's streamlined drag and drop interface and built-in effects, transitions, and royalty-free sounds make it quick and easy to just jump in and start making all the video essays, let's plays, AMVs, or other you can dream up. The software is built with beginners in mind, but it still gives you the control Control you need to make your videos your way. With the tutorial missions added in the version 9.5 update this month, you don't even have to leave the suite to learn how to get the most out of it. Wondershare's been issuing regular updates since the software launched in 2018, improving its functionality and adding new effects to play around with in each one. And the best part is, they don't make you buy into a pricey subscription to get them. For just 70 bucks, you can own Filmora 9 for life, which is sadly uncommon in the world of creative software. And before you even make that commitment, you can try it out for free. Click the link in the doobly-doo to download Filmora 9 today and start getting all of those great video ideas out of your head and onto the screen. The 10 a.m. slot is a crucial one for any Saturday morning lineup. By this point, even the slowest kids will be done with breakfast, and after two hours, many of our viewers may be feeling bored and considering alternate activities. Now's the time we really need to wow them with a one-two punch of can't-miss shows, the best we have to offer. And if you've been watching this channel for any period of time, you will be unsurprised to learn that my first of those is Mob Psycho 100. There's something innately appealing about psychic powers as a concept. I don't think there's a person alive who hasn't fantasized about moving things with their mind, if only because the remote's across the room and they really don't want to get up. Mob Psycho realizes that enticing fantasy like nothing else out there, putting telekinesis, teleportation, and every other psychic ability you can imagine, plus a few you probably can't, to work in some of the best animated action scenes you can find outside a movie theater. Heck, even then, some of the fights in Season 2 can give the flashiest feature films out there a run for their budget. If you want to impress and excite a young audience, Mob Psycho will do it in a matter of minutes, and once it has their attention, its uproarious comedy, twisting plot, and strong cast of characters will keep them coming back. Mob's arc, from anxious, awkward, self-conscious loner to confident, still kinda awkward, but self-actualized social butterfly is especially compelling, and from his positive early interactions with the Body Improvement Club, despite his flimsy physique, to the way he deals with bullying and abuse use later in the series, there are many aspects of that arc that I think could have a serious positive impact on young viewers dealing with similar emotional issues. It's another one of those shows that I wish I could have watched when I was younger. In particular, the way that Mob handles the show's biggest conflicts by constantly trying to empathize with villains and help them change for the better, and only using force when it's absolutely necessary to protect himself and others, sends a great message that every child out there could learn from. Especially 
especially the ones who are big enough to pass for adults now. If you think weak and vulnerable are synonyms, I am talking to you. But of course, kids don't watch shows for their morals, and the main reason Mob Psycho is in this lineup is that it's entertaining as Hiffle. I've said it before and I'll say it again, this show really has it all. Dramatic gut punches, gut busting comedy, and uh, gutsy action? Point is, it's the complete anime package, and so is our 1030 follow-up, Avatar The Last Airbender. I know some of you are going to want to fight me on this, and I can't really blame you for that because I literally asked for it in my Avatar as an anime video, but even if you think the show's western origin should preclude it from lists of anime in general, I hope you'll make an exception for this specific one because those origins are precisely why it is the perfect Saturday morning anime, both in terms of story structure, the way it balances heavy continuity against newcomer-friendly episodic storytelling, and story content. Unlike every other anime on this list, Avatar's narrative was built around the exact American broadcast restrictions that made these Saturday morning blocks what they were. Its story was precision engineered to be as dark, serious, and boundary pushing as it possibly could be with a Y7 age rating. Its action is every bit as exciting and dynamically choreographed as anything you'll see in FMA or My Hero Academia, but with a notable absence of blood and gore. It's a show that speaks to kids without talking down to them, a show that can be enjoyed at any age. Its world and characters are as complex and nuanced as any fantasy-loving adult could hope for, yet fun and goofy enough to excite young imaginations. Its central conflict is easy to grasp in abstract terms of good and evil, but the Fire Nation's specific brand of evil is explicitly rooted in the true history of fascism and imperialism. And thus, it can aid us in understanding important conflicts in the real world, past and present. And its individual episodes tackle equally heavy issues with grace and poise, from coping with grief and survivor's guilt to recognizing and resisting abuse. There's so much to be taken away from Avatar's narrative if you're looking for it, and even if you're not, it sure is fun watching Aang ride wacky animals and bamboozle the Fire Nation with his airbending shenanigans. Thanks to the show's cartoon DNA, even minor conversations and gags that other anime would probably skimp on are expressively animated and fun just to look at. Yeah. 15 years out from its premiere, Avatar still represents the pinnacle of what's possible with serialized Saturday morning storytelling, and I don't think any daytime anime block can truly be perfect without it. But then, I am saying that based on my own taste for martial arts fantasy stuff, and I'll admit that my 11am pick is even more rooted in personal bias. See, for Basically my entire childhood, Digimon was a fixture of my anime diet, and to me, a Saturday morning block just wouldn't feel complete without some of that tween sci-fi adventure energy. But the first two seasons, the second especially, are a bit rough around the edges, and while Tamers is amazing, I think its whole what if Digimon were really real though premise works best with some prior franchise knowledge, so I wouldn't want it to be the first thing kids knew the series see. So instead of trying to split the difference on three suboptimal jumping on points, I've chosen an all around better show with similar themes. Deno Coil. If you're not familiar, and you're probably not because the series came out in 2007 and was only localized in 2016, Deno Coil is basically what you'd get if Digimon and Ghost in the Shell had a baby and then Studio Ghibli adopted it. Well, it was actually animated at Madhouse under the direction of Iso Mitsuo, but its lived-in world and complex young heroines will appeal to anyone who appreciates Ghibli's work. Its setting, a near-future Japan where an increasingly prevalent HoloLens-esque augmented reality network is blurring the line between real and virtual, is well-realized and rife with fodder for philosophical introspection. That's the gits part of the equation, while the Digimon side of things coats those big, challenging ideas in an accessible, family-friendly adventure shell. If that sounds like a lot for one anime to juggle, it absolutely is, yet Deno Coil pulls it off with panache. It's cute, funny, and endearing, yet capable of being incredibly poignant and thought-provoking when it wants to be. Its setting at first seems to offer a lot of fun possibilities, I'd personally love to have a virtual pet like Densuke, but there's a darkness lurking just beneath that surface that our heroine Yuko and her friends 
Jones gradually uncover through working for her grandma's homespun digital investigation agency. Denno Coil is honestly one of the best sci-fi works in any medium for any age group that I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing, and it's a crying shame that, due to its lack of impact on release, Iso Mitsuo has never had a chance to create another show. This one is damn near perfect, though, and its dense atmosphere and layered mysteries would have had me hooked on any morning block that aired it. All of the programming in this block so far was chosen in one way or another for its power to suck viewers in and keep them watching. For our final show at 11.30, though, I want to give our audience a proper send-off, something that'll get them ready to get up and go and seize what remains of Saturday. Though, of course, we do still want to leave them wanting something more, so they'll tune in next week. And out of all the anime I've watched, I can think of none better suited to both jobs than Haikyuu. I've recently talked at length about what makes Haikyuu so good. In brief, though, its animation is incredible, its volleyball matches are tense, realistic, and unpredictable. It has an astonishingly huge cast of fleshed-out, likable characters who form a complex web of friendship and rivalry. The music slaps, and its central characters are some of the most hilarious and lovable shonen heroes out there. I can also personally attest to what a compelling weekly watch its underdog story makes for. I've been awaiting each new episode and season of the series with bated breath for years now. Every last mid-match cliffhanger gets me, and given how popular it is with kids in Japan, I have no doubt that it has the staying power to make this purely hypothetical MBTV morning a consistent hit. But, like I said, the main reason I'm slotting it in here at the end is to send our young viewers off on a strong note. As I explained in that video, Haikyuu just has this way of hyping you up as you watch it. By the time each episode is over, I'm always itching to hop off the couch and do something. And that's exactly what I'd hope the kids watching this block would do. Though, if they insist on being couch potatoes, I guess it also makes a decent segue into whatever sports ball game happens to be happening that afternoon. Ideally, though, I'm hoping Haikyuu would encourage kids to, you know, go outside and play. Because, and I know this is going to sound a little heretical coming from me, that is as important as anime, actually. Get up and play an hour a day. Ouch! And I don't think any of these Saturday morning blocks really did enough to emphasize that. It's not their job to, obviously, they ain't gonna make money from kids being outside, but for a perfect Saturday morning block, that would be a secondary concern to making sure the viewers are happy and healthy. And if things were really perfect, money wouldn't exist anymore anyway, but let's take this one dream scenario at a time. I think this imaginary programming block I've put together makes for a well-balanced anime breakfast. But that is, at the end of the day, just like my opinion, man, so I'd love to hear what you think of my choices and see what your perfect Saturday morning would look like in the comments down below. And if you're looking to keep this nostalgia kick going, consider checking out my recent video about the wacky world building of Yu-Gi-Oh! or my less recent one about those catchy 90s dub openings. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.